I'm Shannon, I'm the CEO at Health Excel. And Ankita, I'd love you to introduce yourself. And I know we have a little slide. Want to understand your journey to date, what brought you here? Why are you so passionate about rare disease? And I am really intrigued by um, one of the lines you have on your LinkedIn, which is that you're a future chief activist. Of <laughs> um, so super curious to hear uh, what that means and what you see yourself doing as well. So tell us a bit about you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ankita Deshpande. So I am based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and I work for currently um, Alexion, which is now the AstraZeneca Rare Disease Business Unit. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, I My favorite question to ask people when I meet them for the first time, um, besides sort of like, where do they like to travel and what do they like to eat, is what did you want to be when you were a kid, um, when you grew up? And I think it kind of gets to the essence of who you are um, and kind of like where your dreams are. Um, so when I was a little kid, I was obsessed with two things. Um, Ebola and tornadoes. So I grew up in Naperville, Illinois. We constantly had tornadoes. Um, and then randomly when I was eight, I got a hold of um, the book, The Hot Zone. And I probably shouldn't have been reading it at age eight, but guess what? My parents let me read whatever I wanted. I couldn't watch any TV. Um, and so I decided I wanted to be a virus hunter and a storm chaser and kind of alternated between the two of them. Um, and I joke when I, when I hit adolescence, my hair got curly and like, Camping, windstorms, um, generally like that sort of environment and curly hair don't get along. So I had to choose a different path. Um, and I, I uh, that. that was the reason that was the deal breaker. That was the deal breaker. Um, so I actually ended up studying bioengineering uh, and business in college um, and went straight into strategy consulting in the life sciences. Um, first at SB, uh, SVB Learing and at Clearview Healthcare Partners. Um, some of my key learnings I put on the slide. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I definitely have had a number of different experiences um, in really different environments, consulting the nonprofit world. Um, I've worked at two different rare disease companies and actually one um, uh, therapeutic vaccine company focused on immunology. Um, and it was funny, I was like debating which learning I should put in there for Genosha because um, the project or the program I worked on for most of my time at Genosha was actually on genital herpes. Um, and my other key learning, and I will share this, uh, out loud, besides the fact that immunology is really complicated, is most standard STD panels do not test for the virus that causes genital herpes. So take that how you will, interpret that information and digest it, go into the world knowing that fact. Um, Love it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, what I'm doing now, yeah, of course, like I'm spending lots of time at my computer, just like everybody else. Um, but I kind of see myself um, in this really interesting role. So I um, am the head of innovation here within the uh, rare disease unit um, at AstraZeneca. And I see my job as sort of three main things. One, being a futurist, right? Like looking into the future, understanding not just industry trends, trends and healthcare trends, but also social trends, political trends, economic trends. How do they come together to create uh, lots of plausible different futures? Um, that we as Alexion um, AstraZeneca rare disease now need to play into, right? How do we make sure we're future ready, future proof um, or future optimized? Um, I also see myself as one of my key roles is um, building champions within our organization for innovation. It's so easy when you work in operating companies to really focus on your quarterly earnings. But you also have to think about how could we do things different, better? Um, how can we break what we've built so we're ready for when it does break? Um, and how do we understand how we can take advantage of new opportunities that may not exist today, but we want to be ready for in the future? Um, and then finally, I sort of view my my last kind of like role within um, AstraZeneca rare disease as a gardener. Um, so part of what we what the innovation team does is we run what we we call an accelerator, but it's misnamed. It's really an internal venture studio where we seed fund a number of different employee ideas. And we actually put teams together and give them money and allow them to test and learn flexibly, very much with the help of Health Excel, um, to be able to see whether or not their idea has legs. Um, and if they can come up with some evidence to say, yeah, like this is something we need to pursue, we then kind of go around to our business and hopefully by next year start to go externally to say, hey, does anyone else want to invest in this to help keep this potential idea going? Um, and so that's really kind of where I focus my time. Um, and of course, I've got a picture of my my cat and dog who, because I'm in the office, won't be making an appearance during this webinar. But otherwise, my cat's pretty much guaranteed to like knock the webcam off my 
um, computer at least once during every major meeting. I've definitely seen your cat a good few times, Ankita, but <laughs> such, a, such a great introduction to you and um, what's brought you here, right? We'll chat a bit more about your accelerator and those initiatives later on. Um, but to take a step back, there are some really big challenges within bringing innovation or introducing digital and technology into rare disease, right? And, and I think there are just fundamental challenges along the patient journey, uh, you know, from diagnosis all the way through treatment initiation and maintenance. Um, and maybe it'll be good to reflect on those key challenges before we jump into the potential opportunities for, for digital, right? Because we yeah. first want to understand the problem before we identify a solution. Totally. Um, so I would say there's two main challenges when it comes to sort of the, the patient side of things, right? The patient journey side. And then there's a conglomerate of one really big challenge um, on the biopharma side. So on the patient side, um, we know... Uh, today based on research that the average rare disease patient probably takes between four and six years to get to an accurate diagnosis. And in that time, they're probably seeing upwards of seven different specialists, potentially seeing four different PCPs or five different PCPs. Um, and they may have three or more misdiagnoses. So that's kind of a lot that's going on there, right? Um, at the same time, um, these patients are not just struggling with getting the right answer, but they're actually struggling with sort of the, the mental, um, physical, emotional challenges of not knowing what's happening. And honestly, sometimes we hear a lot of patients tell us they feel gaslighted by their physicians, people telling them there's nothing wrong when clearly there is something wrong. Um, I remember we listened to a patient story um, of a, a caregiver actually who ended up going on to fund, uh, found an advocacy group. Um, and she knew something was wrong with her child. And for years she would take them to physicians think something's not right and they couldn't find anything. Yeah. And then one day, probably when her kid was like five or six, um, you know, relatively old, um, her father was playing golf with um, a gentleman in, you know, five states away in the U.S. Um, who happened to be a pediatric specialist and was just kind of like, hey, you know, this thing's going on with my grandson. Um, and that's how they got like it, it could be one of these three diagnoses. Go have your kid, your grandson worked up for it. And that's how he got to his accurate diagnosis. So the other big challenge I think that rare disease patients face is, yes, it takes a long time. Yes, they see a lot of specialists, but honestly, that accurate diagnosis is oftentimes a case of serendipity. Yeah. Um, the other key challenge that patients face, and they'll, they'll often share, is sort of everything associated with managing their disease once they have a diagnosis. Um, and so you'll hear many patients say, like, there feels so much relief when they finally get that diagnosis. But in a way, for those of you who are hikers, it's like a false peak, right? Like you think, okay, I know what I've got, now we can move on. But really, there's a lot of work that has to be done, a whole nother mountain to climb to understand now, how do I, how do I manage this disease? How do I live with it? How do I adjust my life um, to treatments, doctor's visits, monitoring, um, the financial burden of all this. Um, finding good care is actually really challenging. As you can imagine, um, rare diseases are rare, they're rare for a reason. So um, we also physicians who are experts in those diseases. And so what we often find is patients will tell us, you know, I'm getting this diagnosis and I'm sitting there Googling it on my phone and my doctor's on their phone Googling the disease <laughs> alongside me, right? Right. Um, and that doesn't inspire a ton of confidence um, in a patient. And it's honestly a huge intellectual burden to expect that every physician will know every single rare disease. It's, it's not reasonable, exactly. right? So. I think another big challenge for patients is how do I get connected to the right care? Um, the and then right how time. do I get that care optimized for me? Because every rare disease has a huge range of heterogeneity. Absolutely, Ankita. I think you've put it so well. And that's the truth, right? Like having practiced as a physician myself, I know that, you know, when you're in primary care, it's impossible. You look at like pyrexia of unknown origin, which is like a catch-all. It can be anything under the sun, right? So how do you accurately diagnose it without, um, you know, being specialized in that in that area? And you're right, sometimes it's months, it's it's years before that that's accurately identified. So there's definitely a lot of scope for improvement. Um, can I tackle the third challenge really quickly? Because I didn't talk yeah, about- Yeah, of course, um, sorry. The, yeah. The no, no, it's okay. The, the biopharma um, challenge. The biopharma side. Yeah, the biopharma challenge. And this one's really interesting um, because in a lot of diseases that we tackle in the specialty space or even in the primary care, care space, there's been a lot of investment by the general scientific and medical community in building up treatment guidelines, practice guidelines, scientific knowledge. And so as a pharma company, when you come into this space, uh, there's a lot of knowledge to build from. 
in rare disease, you don't have that in, that starting investment, right? Right. So a lot of rare disease companies aren't just taking knowledge and like designing therapeutics. They're actually creating the fundamental scientific knowledge that then advances the therapeutics. Um, so there's a lot more work that goes into it, um, a lot less understanding. And even sometimes we find that the literature that exists, the things we sort of view as fact because it's been published in the literature since 1945, um, aren't quite right because it's based on small single center studies um, with, that happen to have some bolus of these rare disease patients. Right. Um, but they're not necessarily true, they're observations. And so oftentimes we, we're not just um, creating new, new scientific knowledge, we're actually updating potentially old, outdated or incorrect scientific mm -hmm. knowledge, which is another hurdle in and of itself. That's really insightful because the lift on the pharma side, um, you know, we possibly underestimate that, especially as it uh, relates to rare disease. Um, I do remember some years ago, Alexion was actually one of the first companies to start the patient registry for BNH, which, you know, didn't exist before. So it's almost like starting the data gathering exercise for the first time in the 2010s, right? Um, so I think it kind of speaks to what you're talking about. That's right. And that's, you know, another unique aspect of the rare disease space is where pharma um, hasn't gotten to yet, right? There's also advocacy groups that play such a big yeah. role in kickstarting some of this type, this type of activity, right? Kickstarting some scientific research, um, venture through venture philanthropy, seed funding a couple of programs, building these really detailed registries, um, getting some of that foundational scientific knowledge going. Uh, patient yeah. advocacy groups can play that role. It's difficult, right? They're they're donor funded, usually caregiver run. Um, yeah. But we, we do see that more and more, the importance of a, a strong patient advocacy group. Are there any challenges to reflect on, on say the payer side, right? Um, there's a general perception and probably fact as well that rare disease treatments are quite expensive. So that can be challenging from a payer point of view, for example, or if it's payer of pocket, then again, that, that's a patient challenge. Yeah, um, and like, you know, I'm, I'm a relatively transparent person and I think somewhere in there, there's a disclaimer that like the views I'm expressing are my own. So, um, you know, not, I'm not speaking for Alexiana or AstraZeneca rare disease in this moment. Um, the way that rare disease business model works, right? Because we have so much R&D lift we have to do, um, that doesn't change, right? Like sure, there are fewer patients, but our clinical trials are still, you know, years long. Yeah. We still have hundreds of patients in these studies. All that infrastructure still needs to exist to do these at the highest quality possible, right? Um, the trade-off is that the small volume um, gives us some bandwidth to have higher prices, right? So right. that's sort of the way the business model works. And I'm kind of foreshadowing, I think potentially one of the challenges in the digital health space is, is that kind of accepted um, cultural acceptance gonna happen in the digital world? And yeah. I think that's the jury's out there. Um, and so the prices are high. And so what we find with payers is there's often sticker shock, right? Um, yeah. The number is very large. But in reality, when you start to back it up and you start to think about what is the budget impact of treating this condition, even at these large yeah. prices, what we've often found is, especially for in the US large health plans or you know in um, Europe across the national budget, it doesn't even increase the sort of per member per month cost, right? Right. Um, right. So on one hand, you, you have sticker shock and we, we do have to navigate that. Um, on the other hand, the things that at the end of the day, ultimately most matter, budget predictability, budget impact, um, and sort of strong outcomes, those things yeah. we can typically address and meet, right? And so the, the trade-off is really about, at the end of the day, how do we, how do we kind of navigate this idea of, of, of sticker shock and make sure that everyone understands yeah. we're really making a difference in these people's lives. Yeah, I think that's well well said, and it's probably about proving the health economic outcomes, right? You're probably spending that much, especially in a nationalized health system in Europe, on this patient patient's visit multiple times over like an eight year period, which otherwise could be put into the treatment. So, yeah, I wish I wish that was the case, but um, again, you know, sort of in all transparency, like the cost offsets argument just isn't there, right? Like many of these patients aren't utilizing the healthcare system because there's nothing the healthcare system can do for them. Can do for them, yeah. So there isn't a ton of offset that, that happens. That doesn't mean that a new treatment can't really change, transform their life and quality of life. Um, you know, I think the other thing, and this is really important area where the digital health space can play, um, is measuring those improvements, right? Like we measure right. improvements 
in sort of the clinical development world in such a rudimentary way. We ask people questions like, how much better are you today than you were yesterday? I don't know. I don't even remember how much I ate for breakfast, right? Like, yeah. Um, so yeah. are there better ways of really, you know, I view kind of like endpoints in clinical trials as an outline of how a patient is. But are there ways we can use digital, um, the digital world, right, to color in those lines, right? Not just yeah. have yeah. this really faint black and white outline, but something really vibrant of a picture of how be- how much better a patient is doing. On that note, I think we can segue perfectly into what are the digital opportunities that present themselves as we have spoken through some of the challenges, right? Maybe first, um, sorry, Kelly, just to move back to the previous slide. We did speak a little bit about how rare is rare, but um, I love that you've quantified it here. Would love you to tell us a bit more about the slide, and then we can talk about the opportunities to solve for the challenges we've just spoken about. Sure. Um, so different countries define kind of the threshold for what a rare disease is as different differently. I mean, really, the reason is is for policy reasons, right? If you're going to have different policies um, towards rare diseases, you need to have a cutoff list threshold. So it's helpful to know going in, like depending on where where you're trying to uh, commercialize or develop your product, you may have different definitions of rare. Um, The US and Europe are are relatively similar in terms of prevalence um, per 100,000. And I put the stadium, Michigan Stadium here, because Michigan Stadium holds roughly 100,000 people. um, And there are roughly like somewhere between 50 and 60 sections. So just to think about that from, you know, sort of a rare disease concept, if you have any more than one person per section, um, with a particular condition in the Michigan Stadium, it wouldn't be a rare disease. Love that. That that's a very practical way of uh, putting it. But really, when you think about it, it's um, some of them are not as rare, right? But it's also probably because the pool of rare diseases is so diverse in in what it what the composition is um, that I think they get all bundled into an, into this one big conglomerate of rare disease. But really, when you get into it. Some of them are truly rare. Some of them are much more prevalent in the population. Right, exactly. I mean, there are definitely conditions where, you know, if you have the Michigan Stadium, you wouldn't have any people, right? You put three exactly. Michigan Stadiums together, you wouldn't have any people with the disease. Um, so it does it does really run the gamut. And, you know, Alexian we used to talk about rare versus ultra rare. Um, and then there's sort of the ultra, ultra rare, which is like wow. you know, um, one person in an entire country will have this condition. Yeah. Um, and, and the dynamics are very different for each of those conditions. Exactly. Um, okay, so maybe the next slide then, Kelly. Yeah, I think we talked through a lot of this already. Um, is there anything in specific? I mean, I can talk, the, uh, the, <laughs> the rotary image is one I'll talk through really quick, only because a couple of weeks ago, I was in France doing a road trip and we have rotaries in Boston, don't get me wrong, but we don't have like six way rotaries. Um, and it really like spoke to me because you're kind of in this rotary and Google Maps does not update quite fast enough to tell you where to get off. So we'd often get off at like the wrong one and it took a little while to realize that like, oh no, you got off on the wrong one. We had to go back in the rotary and go around again. And they're very stressful for me. And so I kind of feel like it's a really good metaphor for uh, you know what a rare disease patient experiences to diagnosis. Like they're on this rotary, it's really stressful. They might get off, but then they probably have to get back on because they got off on the wrong one. Um, and so that was sort of like the, the metaphor that uh, that existed there. Um, I love I that. And and Europe is pretty, um, it's got a lot of roundabouts, that's for sure. <laughs> so that that's interesting. Maybe, Ankita, we can we touched on these, right? And yeah. I think it's almost like outlining some of the, the challenges that, that you spoke to. But what are the opportunities then? What can digital do, for example, to reduce the time to accurate diagnosis? How do you see that playing out um, in an ideal world? Similarly, how can digital help with streamlining and simplifying care and their quality of life, right? And how can it help with reducing R&D cycle times on the pharma side? Yeah, so I kind of view, um, uh, I I sort of break this down into kind of like a a, a couple of components. There's sort of things that can be done on the healthcare system side, and then there's things that can be done for an individual patient. Um, And then there's sort of focusing on getting to a diagnosis and then focusing on kind of simplifying care slash improving treatment availability, which is reducing the R&D cycle time. Um, So if we think about like the healthcare system side and reducing time to accurate diagnosis, I think there's a ton of investment and a lot of work being done already in terms of clinical decision uh, support systems, 
um, as well as kind of mining EMRs and trying to help flag people who should be evaluated. Um, there's a lot of work being done as well um, in terms of like, how do we create like federated data networks to be able to aggregate different hospitals together to be able to um, identify true prevalence um, and true incidence of different conditions. So I think sort of that big data, um, federated learning um, and clinical decision support systems is really big in terms of trying to highlight um, who might need to get evaluated for a rare disease diagnosis before a clinician might come to that conclusion. Right. Um, on the individual side, I think this is also really interesting and um, speaks a little bit to the serendipity piece of how rare disease patients get diagnosed. Um, increasingly, patients feel like they have to be the quarterback of their own care or the detective that finds their diagnosis because they'll go to five different specialties who don't share records, who don't speak with each other, um, who don't communicate. And there's no one person that's taking all that information putting it together and connecting the dots to a diagnosis. The only person that really can do that is the patient or the caregiver. So now this is a really big challenge. How do we empower the patient and caregiver to put their information together and to mine that data to identify you know, what their diagnoses could be and to help be sort of a more active participant in that diagnostic process. Um, and this is, I should say, this has been facilitated by some of the, um, new, the new rules, especially in the US where um, patients are now allowed and have to be provided their data from hospital systems and doctor's offices yeah. if they ask at no cost. So now th there's a source of data for patients to pull their, their information together. Yeah. What do you think, you know, I think you spoke about a system level implementation, whether it's CDSS uh, and maybe Kelly, we can move on to the next slide because it outlines some of the opportunities nicely, um, right? Do you think because rare diseases are rare, there's adoption challenges, right? What can we do to encourage people to adopt some of these um, changes, so to speak, that, that we're talking about um, to support what's a low volume um, intake that really comes into their health system or into their clinic? Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is we have to make it a no-brainer, right? So in the sense that we have to minimize the amount of lift that's required for anyone to adopt it because for any health system, just focusing on one rare disease or a point solution for one rare disease is not gonna make a dent, right? In the yeah. same way that you know a very expensive rare disease treatment is not gonna impact the per member per month cost, um, new tools that reduce utilization or improve outcomes are also, or save costs, are also not going to impact their per member per month cost, right? So in that kind of decision calculus, whether you're a hospital looking at your hospital budget or a health plan or a government looking at sort of cost and coverage, um, you want to adopt things that are going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. And so what we want to do is at least minimize the amount of work or investment, right, that those yeah. organizations have to put in to be able to adopt these types of solutions so that they're more willing to adopt. The other half of it is, can we aggregate rare diseases together? Can we think about these rare diseases in a different way that creates volume, um, where then there is a little bit more um, incentive for adoption? Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think even just um, based on, on the origins of the disease, I think there's a nice way to group them. Um, and, and perhaps that that's a way. Um, Focusing on the right hand side of the slide would would love your perspective, especially, you know, because you are working in pharma. Do you see the value? We spoke a little bit about digital biomarkers, but, um, you know, one school of thought is are decentralized clinical trials really the perfect match, for example, for rare disease, because you have these patients spread out all over. Right. And that's just one one angle, but uh, would love your perspective on on all of these items that are listed on the right-hand side as opportunities. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I kind of see um, virtual care, decentralized trials, digital bar biomarkers, and remote patient monitoring. They're all just one spectrum, right? Um, something happens in the clinical trial, but if you don't, as, as a biopharma company, if we create a system of managing a patient through a clinical trial, right? with virtual care visits, with remote sensors, with um, clinical support, whatever that is, 
And we don't translate that into then the real world solution that launches right. the molecule. We've totally failed, right? Um, it's like creating another research use only biomarker. That's great. Like you have this blood test you can use for your clinical study, but if doctors can't use the blood test in the real world, how are they supposed to monitor their patients? How are they supposed right. to demonstrate outcomes? And it's the same thing with digital biomarkers, right? If you use an actigraph, it's an amazing clinical development tool. But then how does that translate to what's commercially available that your everyday person can wear? Yeah. Um, and we need to we need to make that transition. Um, so I think that's sort of one is like they're part of a spectrum. It's really important, but they serve different purposes. Like on the clinical development side, um, the, the digital world can help in a number of ways. So one um, is ideally reducing the number of patients that are required in a clinical study because you're collecting so much more signal, right? Um, if you can collect um, activity levels every single day over the course of six months, that's gonna be much more rich in terms of your data than one clinic visit where you do a six minute yeah. walk test over the course of six months, right? So if you have more signal, does that mean you can reduce your N? You can reduce your N, that means your enrollment times are lower, your costs are lower. Yeah. We can get to data faster, which means ideally we get to the market, right? So that's one really easy way, theoretically, of reducing cycle time. Um, another is sort of coloring the lines as I talked about before, right? Six minute walk test, of, and then, you know, that's just one that everyone kind of focuses on, is not a great tool for measuring outcome. It yeah. paints a very rough picture of performance, but can we use different things, different sensors to really understand how people are performing in their everyday life on things that matter to them, to really color in those lines and show how change is happening. Um, the third area that I think is really interesting is thinking about N of one studies, and this really gets back to the heterogeneity of disease. Um, and we, we did try this a little bit at Vertex and had some interesting learnings, but um, every patient kind of um, has a different constellation of symptoms and those symptoms impact their function in different ways. So is it possible for us to think about for an individual patient, what are the things that bother you? And then just measure improvement on those things and then show over a population, we actually improve people's lives because we take the things that bother them and we improve them. Um, so instead of treating everybody as the same, we kind of understand that everybody has their own unique set of needs and we're addressing those unique set of needs. Um, and then the last thing I think I'll point out with, with decentralized trials and virtual care, um, you know, I, we, we were talking about how, how patients have to drive, um, you know, 60 minutes yeah. or more to get to their care. Um, it can help us a lot in terms of um, recruiting more diverse patient populations. And I'm not talking just ethnic diversity, but socioeconomic diversity, diversity of thought, um, diversity of um, uh, sort of region, all sorts of different elements of diversity um, if we have decentralized trials. So that, that is another sort of really big opportunity and also gives opportunity to people who do live far away from a clinical site yeah. um, to participate in clinical studies, which is quite frankly difficult if you have to come in every month for clinic visits but you have a job you you know can't take time off you have to have a hotel room all of that stuff right I think what you've defined is is obviously an ideal case um right how this can help have you seen virtual trials in practice in the realm of rare disease um or come across any that that are ongoing there, I think are, there's some early stage studies. So you see a lot of phase two studies and a lot of phase zero slash phase four kind of like exploratory studies. Um, I haven't seen yet solid um, kind of like uh, non-exceptional use of digital tools as sort of your phase three primary endpoint regulatory approval basis. There are a couple, I think, um, programs in, in ultra rare diseases that have kind of petitioned and gotten exceptions with the FDA to be able to use them as primary endpoints. But I don't think it's, I think it's very much an exception um, yeah. and not and not something that is a, is a trend yet. Um, yeah. And honestly, one of the challenges is that um, you need to come with some level of evidence that these digital, digitally derived endpoints, right, or digitally measured endpoints um, are relevant to your patient population. And most of the time we're, we're not investing a priori in, in, develop, in developing that evidence. Um, and neither are the digital biomarker companies, right? They're looking at things like Parkinson's um, yeah. or COPD or heart failure, big conditions where they can kind of generate that kind of information. Um, right. So we can only come to the table as a rare disease company because we're not investing it because the outside world's not investing it with analog data. 
And that begs the question then, so let's think about companies that are providing these products or services, right? Um, those who do take the risk, I guess, of, of getting into rare disease uh, versus only operating in, in other um, conditions like the ones you've listed where, you know, there's, there's a bigger patient population. They can make a stronger case for um, why they're, the work they're doing is important. How do you think about um, building a business case? What, what should a business model be like? I mean, we're struggling with establishing business models, even in COPD, like you mentioned, or diabetes. So um, how do we make it work here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, I can only speak from like some of the experiences we've had, which is on the biopharma side, <laughs> The reality is like, we are looking for molecules. Uh, we're, we're looking, we're prim we pr primarily derive our revenue from molecules. And these molecules, we look to have, you know, a $500 million plus um, annual revenue stream. It's hard to see right now, um, the digital therapeutic side of things um, getting there, right? Like I, 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 in, in the rare space, I think it's even harder. So um, in that context, the way we're working with our um, digital efforts and beyond the molecule efforts is really thinking about how can we support um, our product team, um, either their KPIs, um, how can we give them more opportunity to treat more people or yeah. directly impact revenue in some way, right? So I think we recognize that um, we're not, the digital side is probably not gonna make a dent in and of its own as a, as a unique standalone business model but we have a lot of opportunity to improve the overall healthcare system for rare disease patients in a way that helps them get access to the right treatment faster. Um, and that should impact then, you know, in, in the cases where um, our medicines are the right treatment, it should be able to impact our performance. Yeah. And is that kind of the, the basis for the accelerator that you started? Yes. And that's how we, our, our projects typically will define value. Um, so it's really the value, we, we look at the value proposition we're delivering to yeah. um, the, the key stakeholder, whether that's patients, health systems, physicians, et cetera. And then we look at the value we return to Alexion um, or AstraZeneca rare disease in the context of how are we improving our ability um, right. to serve our patients. And that's perfect, right? Because then that sticks with, you know, the general mandate of the company, you're not digressing very much and, and it still holds true. So what is your perception? You've been running this now for a year, nearly a year? A year and a half, yeah. A year and a half, right. Um, how successful would you say it has been and, and how would you measure that value? Have you been able to measure the value just yet? Um, no, uh, we are working on that. Um, so we've been building pretty slowly in terms of the number of projects that we take on. So it's only this year that we, I think, exceeded 10 projects. Per year last year we didn't quite even get i think we had six total um and the reality is the way that we work right um it's kind of that gardener approach we'll plant lots of seeds um, yeah. and we'll give them all the same kinds of resources and then we see what grows um and when we look at sort of the innovation landscape and other organizations who kind of built the same sort of venture studio strategy um typically only 10 percent of what you plant originally will end up actually even in sort of a large-scale market pilot Right, so um, we're kind of at 16 total projects, maybe 17 total projects we've run in the year and a half. Um, yeah. We have two that are kind of in a pre-pilot stage. We're kind of generating validation. Um, right. And we have a few others that are a little bit earlier. And so we're, we're not quite at the stage yet where we can measure kind of value that we've returned to patients or to Alexion. Um, but we, and that's kind of one of our key areas that we're thinking of from that standpoint is how do we start gathering the information um, and start kind of, you know, having a really strong knowledge management um, and yeah. thought leadership situation where we, all of our teams are doing experiments with their ideas on the regular, right? And they're kind of designing them. Um, how do we be more thoughtful and rigorous about um, collecting that data and, and publishing yeah. that information, at least internally, so we can all learn from each other? Right. And is there a vision to bring that externally once you feel like it's ripe and ready for... For, for prime time so that others can can use it too right it being the knowledge or the accelerator maybe both maybe that <laughs> can be 
accelerated. The, the I mean, products. I have grand visions. Let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like one of the things that one of our goals, um, especially some of the ideas that we can't get traction on internally, right? But they're good ideas and they have evidence yeah. behind them. Yeah. How do we get the external community to start engaging on some of these topics, right. right? Some might be great product line extensions for existing startups. Yeah. Um, some might be really interesting projects for advocacy groups to take on. Right. Um, there's lots of uh, lots of homes for these really good ideas. And I think yeah. a lot of what we do, um, we want to exist in the world, but, but we're trying to take kind of that open source attitude of we don't have to own it. Um, we want to collaborate with as many people as possible so that we help everybody in the process. Right. And do you think um, based on your experience with the wider ecosystem so far, um, do investors find uh, opportunities in rare disease, so say a, a startup or a spin out um, product that comes out from, from something like this, alluring enough an opportunity to, to put their money on? Not yet. I mean, we definitely see in the molecule space, right? There's a ton yeah. of VC investment in there. Yeah. Um, so how does that bridge to digital? I think that's a really open question. And, you know, I've been having conversations with, um, you know, a few sort of digital health focused companies who are like, right. well, we're, we've established ourselves now. We're curious about what Rare could hold for us. And so that's where I think, um, you know, thinking about it from a product line extension perspective might be the right way. The platform is built. The investments have been made. Right now, the incremental cost of thinking about another rare disease, a rare, rare disease, might that economics might work out. So I think that's one one way of thinking about it. Right. Um, I think another way of thinking about it is sort of this idea of grouping diseases enough so that now we have a really compelling business case to start developing a platform. For. Um, I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm not sure where the VC world is landing on digital and rare. Like, I think that that would be a really interesting conversation to explore. Um, we haven't yet. We haven't. Uh, we're not at the point where we're ready to take anything external. So those conversations. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. Maybe maybe that'll be a follow on we'll do in a year from now when you know things start to take shape. Um, before we uh, I jump on to the next question, I encourage everybody. I see a couple of questions trickling in from the audience, but very happy to pick up your questions. So please keep sending them our way and I'll get to them over the next few minutes. Um, so Ankita, I'm really curious to hear what are some of the most interesting people, products, innovations that you have come across so far um, that are addressing rare diseases, right? Yeah, totally. Um, so this is by no means comprehensive. Uh, these are... Um, a, a few that I've been quite inspired by, but you know, there's there, there's a small number to begin with that are focused on rare or have like kind of a rare approach. And of course, then there's an even smaller number that I'm aware of. Um, and so I kind of try to pick a few different ones, but all kind of have a similar theme. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is Mendelian and they're really focused on clinical decision support. Um, they were founded by a couple of clinician researchers in the UK who had been focused on rare disease for some time and very passionate about rare. Um, and reducing the time to diagnosis for rare diseases. And so what they've developed is basically an algorithm that can run through um, the UK prescribing databases. I think there are two major um, primary care databases that cover like 90% of the UK. Um, and so that gives you a really easy way of scaling. Um, and so they've developed algorithms that match, that can kind of troll through EMR data um, and match that with published diagnostic criteria for rare diseases. And they go kind of disease by disease. Um, and then the, the healthcare provider will get a report, you know, on a monthly or quarterly basis saying, hey, these are the patients we think you should work up for these rare diseases. So it's a, a really interesting um, way of working. And now they have an advantage, which is um, because of the rarity of conditions, when we think about um, piloting, right? Uh, when we think about piloting a clinical decision support system, you'll often partner with a single hospital, partner with um, a single trust in the UK. Um, and one of the challenges, because these conditions are so rare, if you don't come up with any patients, you don't know if it's because the algorithm didn't work or there just weren't any patients. So right. you actually have to get enough lives in your pilot to overcome kind of the prevalence element of these conditions. And so by being, being able to um, have these databases that cover most of the population that kind yeah. of having to piece together data to create enough of a database to pilot your algorithm they they address they've taken that challenge away which is really 
that is a really interesting perspective because yeah, you're right. What if the data doesn't include anyone? So is it that your algorithm doesn't work and that you can't use your CDSS or is it that your data set just didn't, didn't have anything that matches? So yeah, yeah, Mendelian is definitely really well known um, in, in Europe and definitely in the UK. Um, so another one that I found really interesting is Casimir. Um, and this was founded by a couple of rare disease caregivers. And what's interesting about their story is they had children who were participating in the clinical study. Um, and they were watching their kids get evaluated in the clinic visit and watching that the, you know, sort of the, the tests that the physicians were doing were, were not, they weren't improving on those tests. But at the same time at home, you know, their kids went from needing help eating dinner to be able to hold a fork by themselves and feed themselves. Right, they kind of went from really struggling to get off the floor and taking 20 seconds to get off the floor to taking 10 seconds to get off the floor. I mean, not struggling so much. Um, and so they noticed that the quality of their movements was changing um, and the kinds of movements they were able to do um, in terms of self-care were changing, but none of that was getting measured by the clinical. Right. And so through the study, their kids weren't improving, but in life, their kids were. And so they started um, a system of videotaping specific movements of their children over time through the study, and then having a physical therapist review those movements to say, how's the quality of the movement changing? Um, and they use that data now to support in the US getting kids um, coverage for some of the um, different treatments that are available. Um, because the, the evidence for the treatment wasn't great, right? The clinical studies weren't great. And so payers will often deny coverage. And so then they can say, no, look, this is how my kid is improving. My kid needs to stay on this therapy. Um, and it's worked. So it's, it's really interesting. It kind of goes back to the N of one idea, right? Like what is right. The, the patient struggling with? How do you note the patient's improvement? Because that's really what's most important. It's not necessarily like that everybody can now do a six minute walk test, right? And yeah. for a caregiver, going from having to feed your child to having your kid feed yourself is a huge time opening, right? Like now you have those 30 or 40 minutes back to do other things. Yeah, I think it's a classic case of improvement in quality of life versus, you know, gold standard clinical improvement. And sometimes the former is enough of a positive reinforcement for them to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, I often joke that a lot of the, the gold standards for clinical improvement, they're not gold, but most people will 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 even argue that, you know, they are um, that they're not good, that they're pewter standards. I don't, they don't even qualify as bronze. Like, um, so it, it's interesting to see that we accept that these are not great ways of measuring disease, but yet there's not a ton of momentum um, and encouragement and sort of like demand to change that. Um, so I also wanted to highlight an individual, her name is uh, Indu Navar. She is the founder of Everything ALF. Um, her husband passed of ALF, um, he was also I think for those of you who may know or not know, he was the kind of founder of Amazon Web Services or that, that feature of Amazon. So um, really important person in terms of sort of our everyday life, because it can only imagine how much of our lives are living, driven off of AWS. Yeah. Um, and so it was really interesting is as she wanted to found her advocacy group, she also kind of said, well, what are some of the biggest barriers for more biopharma investment in ALS and anything in neurodegenerative diseases in general? And again, it kind of comes back to this. There weren't great ways of measuring disease and disease progression and therapeutic effect. Um, and that was limiting pharma's investment because they're sort of like, if we can't measure this well, we can't get our treatments approved. So why are we going to spend that money? Um, and so she's kind of um, sort of built a research interest in developing good tools um, and good endpoints and ways of measuring disease progression um, and treatment effects so that she can remove that barrier to the biopharma investment. That's great. And, and that's probably the investor profile we're looking for someone to sometimes even out of philanthropy, I guess, raise, raise not just the attention, but also the capital that's going to be needed. That's right. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of advocacy groups are very focused on raising awareness, um, which is great. And we need that. But I think having yeah. an advocacy group that's focused on reducing barriers um, is enough. It's, it's a great opportunity. Um, and it, it's a uh, you know, I think a, a great way of advocacy groups, new advocacy groups kind of thinking about how do I find my place? Um, and then the last one is Picnic Health, which is not a rare specific organization, but they do have, um, they do cover a, a number of rare diseases. And this kind of gets back to that idea of a patient 
being kind of the owner of their own data and connecting all of their dots. Um, it allows patients to connect all of their disparate health records and EMR notes um, into one place, organizes it in a nice timeline so that they don't have to continuously repeat themselves to their physician so that they can see everything and kind of how their, their own condition has progressed and the kind of information they have and hopefully help them play detective a little bit more in terms of getting to a real diagnosis and getting optimal care. Um, and it was also founded by a person living with chronic disease. Um, and maybe that's the last thing I'll say is as we think about you know, these organizations and, and many others that have you know, very strong rare disease focus, often somebody who is connected to a person personally with rare diseases, whether they've spent their life researching it, whether they're a caregiver or a person themselves, um, we find that that personal connection is really what's driving um, a lot of the investment of both of, of time as well as emotional effort and sort of personal yeah. investment. Absolutely. And one other company, Ankita, that I've come across, which I think adds, um, you know, adds to this list would probably be Genome Medical. It's um, access to genetic tests at the right time and quickly, um, because not all labs do all the tests, right? And I think that's quite key because that's probably where some of the, the delay in diagnosis is. So I think that that's also a really useful and it's done through teleconsults as well. So uh, it takes away the need to be a certain place, a certain city. So I think these examples are terrific and inspiring as well, like you said, right? In terms of how do we think about, and these are all people who've built businesses on the back of serving a real and important need. So I think that's really promising. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead. No, yes, I was agreeing with you. <laughs> There's a question here. Um, as you discuss the importance of patient advocacy groups, are you finding that patients in your studies are receptive to new technologies? Um, that's a good question. I would say that um, our ingoing assumption to almost every kind of like digitally oriented, anything that has a digital component to our studies is that patients won't want to do it and it will be a barrier to enrollment. But so far we haven't found that to be the case. Um, we've done a couple of patient surveys with patient advocacy groups and sort of said, hey, you know, what's your interest and in, you know we'll get over 70 80 percent of people responding um that they're very interested or already yeah. using digital devices in some way now these surveys are done online so we've already subsetted for people who are engaged in that way right um but i think and here's i think the reality of where we are is um if we want to respect kind of like the world of diversity Every, we can't design one study that's going to really interest everybody, right? There's going to be parts that people don't like. And same thing with products. As we think about digital product development, right. um, we've got to kind of plan a system of solutions, not just one solution for everybody. Yeah. Um, with redundancy, intentional, intentionally developed yeah. redundancy. And I think that's the same thing as we think about these digital clinical studies. We have to find ways to help people participate and encourage them to participate. But also, if they don't want to do the digital part, opt out. Right, like how, how do we find that balance in the way we design our studies right. to give people the flexibility to be feel safe and comfortable? Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's well said. Um, what is your advice for startups or companies, um, digital health products that approach you? Um, how should they prove to you that they add value um, and that they have a strong business case? What, what will resonate? Yeah, um, there are things that we can provide, right, as a rare disease biopharma focused company. We can provide a lot of insight into the patient journey. We can provide a connection to advocacy groups. We can probably provide, you know, really strong connections to investigators. Um, what we can't do um, and what we're not experts in is actually development of, of digital tools. Right. right. Um, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a team of data scientists that are focused on development of digital tools. We don't have device experts that are focused on sort of device development. Um, we don't have user experience folks that can really understand what's what's it going to take to get a patient to use it. Um, how can we really understand the patient's jobs to be done? Right. So I think coming at it with an understanding of here is what we as this digital company can provide to you. Um, yeah. Here's what we need from you in terms of expertise back um, is a really great way of starting, right? Like, let's help help me understand that you understand us and our problems. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's good advice, uh, very tactical as well, and it can work, right? So I think it involves understanding 
what you have already, which I think you've outlined really nicely today. So if someone's listened to this, they probably are well equipped to, to approach you uh, after today. Um, but, you know, beyond startups, we have a diverse uh, group of people listening in today. You know, we've spoken so much about the challenges, the barriers, the, the opportunities, you know, examples. What can we do or what would you like us to do as an ecosystem after today? I know it's just one conversation, but right, I'm, I'm hoping and assuming that it's been inspiring for me. So it's uh, for everybody. What can we do differently to, to make an impact? <laughs> I, lo I love this slide. <laughs> Thanks. I'm in case you can't tell, I'm a big cat person. So <laughs> cats show up in random places in my slides, especially when I like have complete creative control. Um, so here's the thing, I, you know, and and I talk about this um a lot too, just in general as pharma and and biopharma tries to get more involved in digital health. Um, to be to to adopt that open source culture, right? Which means that like we're not all going to sort of own everything we work on together. Um, but instead, we're going to work on things that ultimately advance the space for everybody, right? And, you know, it's all a metaphor, but like rising tide raises all ships. And I think that's really where where we want to focus. And so from a rare disease perspective, you know, um, Alexion considers ourselves kind of um, rare disease champions, right? We want to be the leaders and conveners of the ecosystem to advance um, treatments, technologies, healthcare infrastructure, et cetera, for rare disease patients. Um, and in that context, we, we really want to start engaging more in pre-competitive collaborations, right? How can we work together um, to serve all of our rare disease patient populations? And we've started talks with, you know, other kind of peer and partner companies in the rare disease space, but um, we would love to have more of an injection, right, from, from the digital health world yeah. as well in that. I talked about line extensions. Um, you know, if you're coming from a, a digital health company and you've got ideas of how you can take your existing platform um, and start to tailor them towards rare diseases, like definitely let me know, right? I, that That is such a great way for us to start making an impact really quickly because we can bring the rare disease knowledge and connection. You can bring that technology, the technology and the platform and quite frankly, the users and the operation, right? Which we don't have. Yeah. Um, and we can make a really strong partnership, I think that way. Um, and then the last thing is sort of instead of um, the genotype based approach, right? Like looking at the underlying genetics and subsegmenting people that way. Can we look at the phenotype based approach? And this to me is really important and something that I think as biopharma companies, we often, I don't want to say ignore, um, but we don't focus on, which is yeah. for many of these conditions, there's a period of deterioration that's already happened physiologically. And once patients go on the medicine, they can only recover a certain portion of that, right? Yeah. They've been in a diagnostic odyssey for 30 years, getting on treatment for a couple of years, right? Or even a chronic treatment, you're not going to get 30 years worth of problems reversed. Yeah. But there are supportive care that can help get from like that 80% reversed by the molecule to 100% back to functioning. Um, and we aren't really thinking about how do we address that last 20% yet, right? Yeah. Um, that can be in the case of some conditions, you know, executive executive functioning, coaching. It could be occupational therapy. It could be right. physical therapy. Um, it could be gait improvement. There are so many things that we can do to really help people recover that last that last mile of, of function. Um, and that's where I think the phenotype based basket approach is key. Right? Can we group everybody who has fatigue together, right, or brain fog together, and then start thinking? How do we address brain fog in a digital way? Because it's it's something that's similar for all of these people. And maybe we're not pathophysiologically improving it, but maybe we are mm -hmm. symptomatically improving it, right? And so that's kind of what I'm thinking about from a basket perspective. That's such a nice way to uh, approach it, right? And I think then that probably tackles the volume problem as well, because this exists with multiple other conditions, but it's really helping give that 360 to people living with rare disease. Yeah, and um, we have, we have some I would say we have some precedent for this right in the oncology space where like the tumor might be anywhere in your body, but we recognize yeah. that there's an underlying thread that connects it, right? So do we need to look at them separately, or can we look at people together based on that underlying thread and see yeah. how they respond? Yeah, love that. Um, this has been such a great conversation, Akita. I can't believe we're at time. Um, Thank you so much, right? Uh, this was such an inspiring, stimulating conversation. 
hopefully everybody that's been listening in found it just as interesting as I did. I really appreciate you joining us and you're such a breath of fresh air as well. So I really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And please reach out if you have any questions. I love connecting with the broader community.